My respected brothers and sisters, again, if you're in the hallway and uh, you're coming for the program this evening, I would encourage you to please join us in the uh, gymnasium. Let me take this opportunity on behalf of the Islamic Institute of Toronto to welcome you to our program tonight. The program is entitled The Quran, A Closer Look and an Approach to Understanding the Quran. And we have our dear brother, Dr. Jasser Auda, who is no, no stranger to the Islamic Institute of Toronto. He has been with us and has been one of our faculty, as it were. Maybe don't pay him, but uh, <laughs> he's been providing us with a lot of uh, advice and support over the years as we try to navigate some of the complexities impacting on contemporary society that we live in. In particular, as, as we know, even during the pandemic, he was a fixture at many of our programs, and uh, we are indeed very uh, privileged, and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the opportunity to see him in person. And we hope, inshallah, to benefit again uh, from the vast amount of knowledge uh, that he has and brings with him. Those of you who are here for Jum'ah uh, got a glimpse of the expansiveness of his knowledge when he spoke about the three pillars or the three foundation upon which the Islamic economic system is built and then talk a bit about how we can juxtapose uh, those Islamic concepts within the society that we live in. So we don't need to give up. We can still, as Muslims, continue to strengthen the deen in all aspects of our life by applying our Islamic principles within the society that we live in without compromising our deen or indeed uh, breaking any laws. I also want to welcome those brothers and sisters who are online. As many of you know, the Islamic Institute of Toronto has an international reach and we are very privileged and pleased that we have the opportunity to, to provide service not only to our community, but also uh, to brothers and sisters internationally. So once again, brothers and sisters, it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome again our dear brother who uh, will uh, talk to us about and, uh, how we approach the Quran. I should also uh, remind you that we have a deeper look uh, tomorrow, inshallah, uh, from 10 o'clock to about 2.30. I understand the registration is, uh, is closed, but uh, if you're interested in uh, attending, we can reopen the registration and have you registered. So without further ado, I would encourage uh, you also, if you haven't registered, to, uh, to walk in, those of you who are online. This is a very important uh, lecture. This is, uh, in, some, in some respects, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to spend time with our dear Sheikh. So without further ado, I'll ask Dr. Jasser Auda to address us. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, hamdun kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fi, mubarakan alayhi, kama hibbu rabbuna arda. Kama yambaghi li jalali wa jayu azim sultani. Wa salatu wa salamu ala as'ad al-khalqi wa khatam al-rusul Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Wa radhi Allah ala al-muhajirin wa al-ansar. Wa man taba'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen. Thumma amma ba'd. My dear brothers and sisters, I welcome you and I thank my dear brother for Jana's introduction. It's always to be good to be back in IIT. I remember the launch of Islam.ca uh, when we used to live back in the 90s in Toronto. Uh, so, alhamdulillah, my brothers came a long way since that day uh, to uh, an institution, mashallah, that has quite an impact, mashallah, on the ummah here and the ummah at large. Uh, the topic I would like to talk about uh, with you is approaching the Quran, my brothers uh, mentioned a deeper look, and it's just a matter of different needs for what we need as a Muslim Ummah. Uh, some of the needs of the Ummah in terms of the Quran are basic needs, are needs about how to read the Book of Allah, 
in terms of tajweed, in terms of the uh, reading of, of that book, and at, at a more, let's say, advanced level, how to understand the different meanings of that book and the different uh, tafsir, let's say, what people said about the Qur'an in our history, and how to benefit from the Qur'an in your life, perhaps a more uh, developed or advanced or um, complex uh, approach would be about uh, how the Qur'an could apply to today's issues and today's world in matters of fiqh or in matters of Islamic thought in general. And all of these are different departments of people who are trying to serve the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is at the heart of Islam, as you know, and is the foundation of this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I will share with you uh, today about is a different kind of department of trying to serve the Qur'an, which has to do with the more, if you wish, intellectual issues, to speak in English. In Arabic would be with more of the ilmi or usuli kind of questions. Why are they important? It's because the deeper you go in the level of dealing with the Qur'an in terms of the usul, the more impact you have on the minds of Muslims and non-Muslims for that matter who would like to learn about the Qur'an. And some of the issues we have and some of the questions, especially the questions of the new generations and the questions of non-Muslims about Islam today, cannot possibly be answered without a more deep approach and a more critical approach. And allow me to, to speak in, in English, critical would be more naqdi in Arabic, but it's not naqdi, we're not trying to destroy anything, but we're trying to naqd, as naqd al-hadith in our past, people, the scholars of hadith, they looked at it and then they critiqued, is this hadith at what level? and who are the narrators, and are they biased or not, and do they have a good memory, and um, this Arabic sentence that you are narrating about the Prophet, is it correct Arabic? Therefore, yeah, if it's not correct, then maybe, no, there, there is some, something went wrong. Naqd, the naqd has to do with critique, and that is not something we learn from um, European Renaissance, that's something that we have in Islam from day one the critical view of the information that you get. or uh, another reading. When somebody gives you information, you need to confirm that information, and you need to clarify. two readings, clarify and confirm. And from that perspective, I will share with you some of the issues that I think I could contribute. Maybe some other brothers or sisters could contribute to the other departments of teaching you the departments of tajweed or the issues of a certain tafsir that you have a journey with or the application of the Qur'an to today's issues or fatwas or in the Islamic thought. But I will deal with you in terms of the approach of reading the Qur'an, which is the question of how. How are you going to read the Qur'an? First of all, are you allowed to read the Qur'an and reflect upon it and deduce some of the lessons for your life? And the answer is obviously yes, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Don't they reflect upon the Qur'an? In Surah An-Nisa and in Surah Muhammad, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah in subhanahu wa ta'ala in several places is asking us not just to read but to reflect upon the Qur'an. What does it mean to reflect upon the Qur'an? And what is the problem? Why aren't Muslims reflecting upon the Qur'an? Many Muslims read and many Muslims hear the Qur'an but they don't sit and read for themselves and they don't 
benefit from the Qur'an to themselves. There is a system, if you wish, of clergy that we developed. And I mentioned in the introduction for those who are coming late that this is more on the intellectual side of reading the Qur'an. There is a system of clergyhood that we developed that is actually dividing between Muslims and the Qur'an, is separating Muslims from reading their book. And we think that reading the Qur'an is only for scholars, not for the average Muslim. And we have some funny fatwas that do not allow non-Muslims to touch the Qur'an and not allow people to read the Qur'an if they, uh, you know, for our sisters when they have their menses or when the brothers. And all of this is not true. Uh, there are so many myths out there that prevent Muslims from opening the book and reading it. And we as an ummah, part of our culture and part of our identity, original culture and original identity, is to open that book and reflect upon it and read and have your own views about it. I'm not asking you to talk about something that you're not qualified to talk about. So I'm not asking you to read the Quran and go give a fatwa about matters of, let's say, marriage and divorce and custody, if you are not a specialized person in family law, because there is a lot of in the Quran about that, but that requires some training. I'm not asking you to divide inheritance if somebody dies, Allah forbid, and you divide the inheritance between their family, uh, if you're not trained to do that. I'm not asking you to talk about the history of humankind or the history of Judaism or Christianity if you're not really somebody who studied a lot of what the Christians and the Jews did to Islam in the religions they developed and how you can speak about it. So in other words, I'm not asking you to talk about something that you're not qualified to talk about in the Quran, but I'm saying that every Muslim is qualified to talk about Islam and about what Islam is about and to have the Quran shape their worldview. And that is my point here is that the, these preventers from you reading the Quran and reflecting upon it do not want Muslims to be empowered by that book. Why? Long stories, it's not my topic. Lots of politics, usually politics, lots of economics, lots of issues that make uh, people in certain intellectual circles promote the idea that Muslims cannot read their book and they have to depend on a clergy. And if you read in the history of Christianity and Judaism, what the rabbis did with Judaism and what the priests did with Christianity writ large, is that they transformed Islam from a religion of the people to the religion of the rabbi. They call it rabbinical Judaism, for example, or where you cannot read your script. In fact, until recently, until their scripts went on the internet, they were not reading their scripts. And if they go to the temple, they don't touch the scripts. And the scripts come out in a big celebration and so on and carried on the head. And we do that sometimes. And then back to the nice uh, golden box but they are not reading the scripts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَنَبَذُوهُ وَرَاءَ ظُهُورِهِمْ وَاشْتَرَوْا بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا They put it behind their backs and they sold it for a price. Many, many uh, of the shapers of the Muslim cultures would like for Muslims to follow that path. And in fact, the Prophet sallallahu told us that we will follow people before us uh, bit by bit. Uh, you will follow the people before you bit by bit. Even if they enter a hole in the desert, you will enter that hole behind them. Why? Because that is how true religion is corrupted. Uh, true religion is corrupted when people do not read their scripts. They don't know. I have friends who call themselves Christians. They never read the Bible or call themselves Jews, and they never read the Torah. And Muslims are not supposed to be like that because we are a different religion. We have a book that says in the first line after the Fatiha, in the Fatiha, Ahidina Salat al Mustaqim, guide us to a straight path. The first line after the Fatiha, You asked for the straight path, 
Here is the straight path. Here is the huda. Here is the guidance. So this introduction, just to apologize perhaps for the kind of discourse that I will uh, engage you in, because I think it's necessary that we take a critical approach to our Islamic realities, especially on the intellectual level. And I don't think that we are doing Islam a service to put some of our problems under the carpet and not to look at our issues with the fundamentals of Islam uh, in our cultures. Now, why aren't Muslims reading the book of Allah? One of the most obvious issues is the Arabic language. Uh, the Arabic language is the language of Islam. In fact, is the language of humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down Adam with a form of Arabic. That is what you learn if you read history from its Islamic books. If you read history from secular academia, and therefore you come from a Darwinist worldview, you will read that Adam started with some sort of an ape-like language, they call it a pseudo-language or something, or a simple form of Hebrew, which the politics is obvious in this. And then you, you think that we did not come down on earth with a language or with a religion. You know, the faith is invented by the pharaohs and laws invented by the Iraqis and so forth, and literature, and, and all of this. The Qur'an is totally against these premises of the basis of humankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Adam, read in any of the surahs that talk about Adam from Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, Allah told Adam and his wife not to eat from that tree unless you will become, uh, you will commit injustice. The shaitan came to them and told them that if you eat uh, from that tree, you will live forever or you will become angels. And then they ate from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blamed them for that, sent them down, sent message with Adam so that he can repent. This is language. This is not ape language. This is Arabic. And yes, there are two stages of Arabic. You read that in the history books of Islam, that Adam came with an ancient form of Arabic that developed into the ancient languages we know, the ancient Egyptian and the ancient Adian and Thamudian and Phoenician and so forth, eventually developed into uh, the al arabiya Al-Mubayyana, the Prophet Sallallahu in hadith, are a few of them, but the one that is more authentic, he said that Ismail, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam learned Arabic from Jurhum, from the people of Arabia. At that time, Hajar spoke with them. Hajar was Egyptian. She was able to speak with them because her language was close to the Arabic language. And Ibrahim was from Iraq, and he spoke to them too because his language was close. And when you look into these ancient languages, these are close languages. And therefore, Ismail outspoke his people and out perfected them in Arabic, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad. And therefore, he spoke al arabiyyatul Mubayyana. He spoke the clear Arabic. That clear Arabic is what we read in the Quran. So Arabic is not just the language of the Quran, it's a language of humanity, the original language of humanity that developed. And of course, the competing theory that is dominating academia today is the Semitic language theory. It's a very political theory, not my topic, but basically that Sam, the son of Noah, uh, including from his offsprings would be the Arabs, but Arabs somehow are not part of anti-Semitism. But uh, the, the Semitic languages are going to develop in order for um, Hebrew somehow to become the language of all of these prophets. Even though Hebrew as a language you read in the Muslim research, was developed after Musa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and not during the time of Musa. Musa's uh, alwah or uh, the scripts were revealed to him in the ancient Egyptian language of the pharaohs of the time. So the issue is that the Arabic language is fundamental to Islam and it is fundamental to humanity and it has a deep history in every language. Uh, those who are interested, researchers, I can send you books that relate 
the Arabic to the old Latin and the old Saxonian and the old Sanskrit and so forth. My point is that Arabs who are speaking the Arabic language, they distorted the original higher Arabic. Uh, most of them do not understand the higher Arabic. The most, most of the Arabic person who grows up in one of the Arabic capitals would not understand the Quran in a reasonable way. But those are less than 20% of Muslims. The majority of Muslims did not learn this language. And that is one of the major problems we have in tadabbur al-Qur'an, in reflecting upon the Qur'an. People who don't know the language of the Qur'an, they lack a lot, and they give their reign, if you wish, they give their deen to people who tell them what Islam is about. And you see this in the minorities and the majorities of Muslims who don't know Arabic, and therefore they, they let uh, so many shapers of culture shape what they know about Islam. Uh, they, they teach them Islam that fits with the Malay culture or politics, the African culture or politics, the Turkish, the whatever, you name it, uh, European languages. And they don't um, let them read the Book of Allah because they don't understand it. And most Muslims speak more than one language, even the local languages. And it is not difficult to learn the Arabic language. Uh, why my brother might remember when we first came to this country, we hardly spoke English as Arab uh, students. And we learned the language. And now we teach in it and write in it. So it's a matter of learning. And alhamdulillah, you meet everywhere in the world scholars and students of knowledge and people who are serious about Islam who learn that language and learn how to read the book of Allah and reflect upon it. So I know that this, I'm starting with a high ground of objectives, but you can do that. If you're a young man or woman here, please learn Arabic. It's not difficult. It's a very systematic language, much easier than French and English. I learned both. Uh, and I, am the, I can tell you that. So please learn the language of Islam. Arab is not the language of Arabs. Arab is a language of Islam. There is nowhere in the Quran where the Arab race is mentioned. There is nothing called the Arab race. You mean the Arab race, Ya'rub of Arabia, and Qahtan and Adnan, and so forth. That is not Islam. This is uh, Arab. And the Prophet Sallallahu in the Hadith, he mentioned um, the companions were actually fighting, uh, and, and there was Suhaib, the Roman, and Salman, the Persian, and Bilal, the African, and so on. And some of them were telling them, what are you doing here? You're not even Arab. So the Prophet ﷺ was told, he was very upset with that. He came out, he said, To be Arab is to have an Arab tongue. If you spoke, speak Arabic, then you're Arab. He changed the definition of Arab وسلم, so that any of my brothers and sisters here who speak Arabic are actually Arab and are no less Arab than a guy from uh, Quraysh like myself because I know people from Quraysh who don't speak Arabic and therefore they are not Arab in that sense even though they are from Quraysh, you see. It is important that we know that. Um, why is Arab an Arab race rather than an Arab language? We have a long history of politics of that from the time of the Abbasides and I don't want to get into history too much but basically look for history for these big questions that we have and now why aren't Muslims uh, as good with Arabic as Muslims in the past? Those of you who come from Africa or come from Asia would know that your ancestors actually spoke much more Arabic than what you have today. Uh, those whose languages changed you know, the, the, now there is a fight in, in the Urdu between the Urdu English and the Urdu Urdu, the Urdu Arabic, and the Malay English and the Malay Arabic, and the Swahili English, the Swahili Arabic, in the sense that many of these languages are fighting for their Arabic identity. The Turkish uh, language already lost its scripts into the Latin scripts, and that was the first step of separating the Turkish tongue from the Arabic. Because once you read Turkish in its ancient script, and you know the Arabic language, you will understand most of it, because most of it is Arabic. 
زواج أن نكاح أن طلاق أن جنازة أن صلاة أن زكاة أن حج أن عمرة أن الله الملائكة والكتب والرسل وال... This is every language is like that because Islam shaped these languages. Islam at some point shaped the Malay language, for example, when it used to be written in the Arabic script. Now that it's written in the English script, it is becoming very challenging to know what exactly the person is saying in the Malay language because they no longer write Arabic or speak Arabic. Now what happened is that colonization made sure part of what the colonization of the Muslim lands made sure of is to make sure that they separate them from the Arabic language. The hundreds of Arabic teachers in every African province that the French killed by themselves, just look at the French massacres of the Arabic teachers in Nigeria, just that part of history. And you will find battles upon battles that the soldiers went and slaughtered the Arabic teachers. Not, not the sheikhs, not the imams. They might leave the imams if they agree to the politics, but they slaughtered the Arabic teachers because they did not want this language to be a part of the Muslim identity. In the times of colonization, that was what they're doing. They are trying to colonize and minimize the resistance. So that's point number one, that Arabic language is not exactly popular, and therefore we have a problem with reading the Qur'an. Still, you can read the Qur'an through the translations. And this is my point number two, is that if you're not a uh, person who learned Arabic and you don't have a chance to do that, you could still read the English translation and reflect upon the Qur'an. Because yes, it's not Qur'an, and it is a tafsir, it is a, an interpretation, uh, but every interpreter will give you quite a lot of the meanings of the Qur'an. They are not the beauty of the Qur'an, of course, and they are not the, the kind of high language that could bear many meanings. English is very limited versus Arabic. Arabic could bear eight meanings in, in a language, in, in a sentence. Uh, tomorrow we talk about some of the tafsir. Oh, some of the ayat were read in a number of times, and it's the same sentence. But Arabic is like that. In English, they give you one of the meanings only, not every meaning possible, but you still have one meaning. And you could still know a lot about Islam through reading the Quran in English or French. Here I'm speaking in Canada, because at the end, the English or French is giving you an idea about that book of yours. And it's not right that a Muslim lives and dies without reading the Quran. Yes, in Arabic, if you understand it, if you don't understand it, it's ibadah, but this is not what I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about the ibadah of reading. I'm talking about activating the Quran in our culture and in our life, which we have some lacking in. So I'm asking you to go look for English or Arabic uh, translations and read for yourself and reflect. And if you stop at something that you feel is funny, Go and look for other translations, and perhaps then you can start to see that uh, some interpretations could be right, some interpretations could be multiple. Maybe you stop at something and you think it's maybe a funny word, and then you go, you find some three other translators giving you a better interpretation or a better translation of that. So that is point number one about Arabic. One of the problems in reflecting upon the Quran is that we are told that we have to read a tafsir when we read the Qur'an. And yes, some of the tafsir are translated in English or French, as uh, you, some of you would read. And yes, when you read a tafsir, you learn more information. Tomorrow we have a lesson of tafsir, because um, there are different streams of tafsir. One of them, a tafsir al-athari, or a tafsir with the history, uh, or the narrations. So, the tafsir al athari like Ibn Kathir, will take the ayah and then will narrate all the hadith that has something to do with that ayah. So you get some information about what the ayah is about in terms of hadith. But is this the tafsir of the ayah? No. The tafsir of the ayah is what you should understand when you read the ayah. But the tafsir of Ibn Kathir is tafsir Ibn Kathir. And tafsir of al-Tabari is al-Tabari. Is their view but it's a narration and it's mentioning the ayah. Yes, but most of these narrations are post the ayah, are not why the ayah was revealed. 
uh, because what the, why the ayah was revealed, if it is mentioned in the ayah, like in Ali Imran, you went up the mountain. Al Imran is speaking about Uhud. And therefore, yes, the ayat are about Uhud. But when you read in a tafsir that the ayah is about so and so, no, it is not about so and so. It might apply to so and so. It applies to that companion or that incident. But it's not for the incident. And that is a problem because for every ayah, you will find a claim that somebody is actually related to that ayah. That ayah is, is about so-and-so. Not about the munafiqeen, for example. Not about the hypocrites it, uh, at large. They give you one name, uh, Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul, for example. And then the whole thing in the Quran about the hypocrites is about Abdullah ibn Ubayy. And yes, he was a munafiq, but the Quran did not reveal, was not revealed because of Abdullah ibn Ubayy. The Quran is revealed because of our life. And therefore, when you read about the hypocrites, don't be imprisoned in what the tafsir will give you in terms of the uh, story. But make sure that you see the specific meanings in their place and the general meanings in their place. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about a specific event, then know that these ayat are about Badr or Uhud or Fath Mecca or about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, uh, uh, Zayd, the Sahabi that he adopted. That is about particulars. But when you see Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is talking about uh, the people and societies and the universe and the mountains, and he's talking Subh'anaHu Wa Taala about sincerity and lying, he's talking about witnessing over humankind, don't put yourself in a box because these ayat are for the ummah, are for every time and every place. Sometimes the tafsir is biased to a particular school. You read a tafsir by somebody who is from a particular, um, one of those old schools of jurisprudence, and you will find him basically always bringing that school to the front in the interpretation. And that is a form of interpretation, but you have to know that Islam is much wider than that. There is a difference between fiqh and the history of fiqh. And you are not supposed to box Islam only in the books that were written in the past, some of which are fixed and some of which are variable. Some of the stuff that we inherited in fiqh are related to the fixed parts of Islam. And the fixed parts of Islam are usually related to ibadah, what we call ibadah, or the rituals, or the sha'air, to be more accurate. How to pray and how to do uh, hajj and umrah and zakah and wudu. Wudu is not going to change. What's in Surah Al-Nisa or Surah Al-Ma'idah is not going to change about wudu. But economics will change, and politics will change, and society will change. And your approach to history is supposed to change as you know more archaeology and you discover more stuff. And your approach to the environment is supposed to change. Because as you know more about plants and animals and where, where we live, the Quran is going to give you more information. Uh, and the Quran is going to put the fundamentals of your knowledge as you approach life. And this is another myth that the Quran is not capable of doing that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Ma farratna fi kitabin shay. We did not leave out anything in the book. It doesn't mean that you will find the equations of physics and the curves of economics in the book, but it means that you will find how to deal with economics and how to think about physics. What are the objectives of that science? And what are the governing concepts of that science? And how you can approach the reality that you live through the Quran. And therefore, we're not supposed to fall into the myth that the Quran is just generalities about aqeedah, about the faith of Allah and his names and so on, and some history. And when there is talk about reality, it's actually boxed in one of the windows of the seerah or the history, and that's it. And that the Quran is not relevant to today's debates about every science and every phenomenon. That is a problem that we as a Muslim Ummah suffer from. And it made us victims to sciences and philosophies and disciplines that are not Islamic. So you find the Muslim psychologist 
who is actually a very good Muslim, he or she prays in the masjid, they give zakah, and so forth. But when they think about psychology, they come from a Freudian worldview. They think based on Freud's framework of the psychology of the human being, not how the human is defined in the Quran. And yes, the human is defined in the Quran, contrary to how Freud defined the human. And the Freudian way of defining the human is actually something that we consider to a large part sinful to, to think like that or to, and, and yes, there could be evil desires in a human, but that's not what the human is. The human is much better than that. You find a Muslim who is a very good Muslim, he or she comes to the masjid, but when they do economics or trade or any of that, they do riba from A to Z, and they do everything that is not allowed in the book because they don't understand the book. They don't read the book this way. And they tell you, well, I'm an economist. I cannot read the Quran because I don't have a bachelor's or so in Sharia. Well, I'm not asking you to give fatwa about wudu or talaq, but I'm asking you to give fatwa about economics. And you are an economist. And I can promise you that those who studied Sharia only, uh, like many of the sheikhs, are not going to be able to understand the economic matter. They cannot really fathom how the modern state works. They still think they live in a different state with different currencies and different structures, and they don't understand how the modern state works. And if you, as a Muslim economist, is not going to read the Quran and is not going to develop a new fiqh of economics, and of course, you're not going to be the first person. There are a few in an area that's called Islamic thought, al-fikr al-Islami, a very unpopular, non-cool kind of area that some Muslims do, but it's essential because if we don't have Islamic economics, we really cannot do economics from an Islamic perspective. And we really cannot copy from the books of the past because yes, there are fixed matters in the books of the past, but they don't talk about today's markets and today's currencies and today's economics. The same thing with politics. You are a political scientist. You're interested in political activism or social activism and so forth. When you read the Quran with those eyes, you will see things that are different from what somebody is going to see if their background is law or their background is Arabic language or any of these Arab uh, 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 Shari disciplines. They see different things. And how are you going to deal with the political issues? Uh, you cannot go and copy from Ibn Taymiyyah or Mawardi or al Juwaini or any of the books that were written on what's called the Siyasa Sharia, because that Siyasa Sharia is talking about a different state and a different ministry and different. That you really cannot copy almost anything from al Mawardi's uh, book or from al Juwaini's book, except for some of their approaches. Ibn Khaldun could be very interesting. But the world that Ibn Khaldun lived in is not the world we live in today. And it's not possible that you deal with the politics of today through these people. And therefore, the Muslim political scientist or somebody who's trying to do political activism, they come from a, mi a mixture of Machiavellian and Durkheimian and a, a mixture of methodologies that shaped what we call political science and international relations and all of this. And they don't come from an Islamic perspective. And they think that they are, because they're Muslim, they are doing is Islam a favor. But when they approach politics, not from an Islamic perspective, they end up with what I call in some of my books, intellectual schizophrenia. They end up with two personalities. One personality, once they enter the mosque, they are that Hanafi brother who made sure that they have their kufi on and they have, they follow the Hanafi madhab as, you know, Islam, what Islam is about and nothing else. And then outside the mosque, they are secular. They're secular people. There is no difference between a minister, a minister in one of those uh, countries where there are Islamic parties and a minister in Europe, in a random country in Europe. It's the same guy doing the same economics and the same politics and the same policy when it comes to medicine, when it comes to society, when it comes to knowledge and education, when it comes to anything. Because he is not qualified properly and he doesn't read the Quran properly. He reads the Quran with the uh, school of the Hanafi Madhab in terms of ibadat only in his mind and not what he needs as a political scientist when you think about politics. 
And therefore, we must go beyond the issue of being locked in somebody else's worldview. And as Muslims, we need to read the Quran. I'm not saying that every one of us will have a commentary on the Quran because people are different in the level of education, the time they can dedicate. But every one of us will have to have a journey with that book. And if you are somebody who practices counseling seriously, then you have to know what Islam is saying about the human nafs and what it is. You have to. Uh, and it is a fard on you to learn that bit of Islam. You're not going to give fatwa and anything else, but you're going to give us fatwas in psychology because you already do, based on Freud. And we want you to go beyond Freud. And if you are somebody who is basing their uh, sociological knowledge on Durkheim, you need to go beyond that. Or if you are somebody who is doing architecture based on the French Renaissance, you need to go beyond that. And you really cannot go and copy the domes from Baghdad because these are not architecture that you can do today. And therefore, you have to create a theory of architecture that is suitable for today. And yes, there are a few. You will find a few Islamic theories of architecture, but you will have to dig for these books because these are not the books that you will find in the Google searches or any of these commercial, uh, commercial tools. You, th these are not to be promoted. You're not going to find that. Um, if you are a, a Muslim doctor, you have to know what Allah said in the Quran about the human being. Uh, about the structure of the human being. And there is a lot of information. When you read with your doctor eyes, you will see something different. Because so far, if you are trained in Western medicine, you are going to define the human in a particular way. And you define life and death in a particular way. You define health and sickness in a particular way. And Islam has a whole genre of theories about what, what is sickness and health and what is life and death and what are the roles of these organs. And you are not going to approach fiqh tib, the fiqh of medicine, as people approach it today, just, you know, if there is alcohol in the vaccine, and if you can, you know, uncover your arm for the doctor to give. It, these are very, very tiny issues. Yes, they are Islamic issues, but they are not really how you should understand medicine. If you are a doctor, if you are somebody who works in the market, you have to know what Islam said about riba, and, and you have the ability because you are trained in that. You are trained in monetary um, stuff and you know your economics macro and micro very well before you trade in the market. And therefore, you have to go and know wh what to do and the finances and so forth, depending on the level of activity you are doing. But you have to have your own reflection upon the book of Allah uh, and, and that is important. Now, the third point I would like to make after the Arabic language and the issues of tafsir and madahib. The third point I would like to make, or the third obstacle, if you wish, and I, I hope, inshallah, like I, I would make this point clear so I'm not misunderstood, is how the hadith is written, the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see, there is a difference between the hadith and the sunnah. The difference is between Muhammad's life and what people narrating about Muhammad. What people narrate about Muhammad وسلم, could be a true narration, but could be not representative of his uh, speech, for example, that went on for half an hour, and the narrator took one line of it and is giving you a hadith that is a true narration, but it doesn't give you what is before and what is after. That is one. It doesn't sometimes, uh, it, it doesn't put Islam in the right perspective. Like for example, compare the topics of the Quran and the topics of Hadith. I know it's a bit of an advanced topic, but for those who studied Bukhari and so on, and those who, who read some of the Hadith books, you will find that there is a difference between how Islam is represented in a book of Hadith, even if it's authentic, and how it is represented in the Quran. Um, take the topic of the shaitan, for example. The, the shaitan in the Quran is, is about big, big problems and big faults. And the shaitan is actually going to waswas. The shaitan, I'll read a few verses to give you a picture of what I mean. 
إنه ليس له سلطان على الذين آمنوا على ربيم يتوكلوا الله is saying that the shaitan has no power over those who are believers and do tawakkul on Allah and therefore the shaitan cannot really close doors or open doors or turn off the light the, the, Allah is saying he doesn't have any power except for what? except for al-waswasa waswasa is, is not to you know, become part of you or that, no, that's different, that, that, I'm going to get to that. But the waswasa is to whisper in your mind. And the, the shaitan is going to tell you that, oh, this is a good idea and it's a bad idea. The shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, is going to make Muslims into factions uh, and, 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 and make them firaq. Will make Muslims into groups that fight each other. That's the work of the shaitan. The shaitan is, is going to make people kill themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a different verse. So people who commit suicide, that's the shaitan giving that waswasa to them. Uh, the shaitan is going to uh, put some pointers to the, to the ayat here, is going to ask people to worship the taghut, the tyranny. People become tyrannical from the waswasa of the shaitan, and those who follow tyrannies, they follow tyrannies because of the shaitan and the waswasa. Uh, the shaitan is going to ask people to worship somebody else other than Allah, and to do riba, and to do riya, and to do every sin in the book. So the shaitan in the Quran is about, is about big things, is about you as a mu'min, a believer, have to be very careful that the shaitan doesn't deceive you. Uh, some of the scholars have books about the deceiving of the shaitan, very important books. The shaitan could tell you that this is good and it's not good. How do you know? The book is telling you that if it pleases Allah, if it doesn't, if it's going to lead you to a sin, if it's uh, so forth, it's shaitan. When you look at the shaitan in most of the narrations of hadith, you will find him about the small things. You will find him about the yawning and sleeping on your nose and uh, eating with you. And, and yes, there could be sayings of Muhammad وسلم, about that. But the other sayings are there too. But you don't find them in the collections. Because the collections are too simplified, if you wish. They simplify matters. They make matters very practical. And, they, and the books that make matters more practical and more simplified become more popular. Uh, I'm talking about the authentic books. Of course, the non-authentic books, you don't believe in them anyway, they're lies. Scholars of hadith did this homework and they tell you that this person is a liar, don't take this hadith from. But I'm talking about the authentic books and if you don't study the hadith with the Quran, you're not going to understand the sunnah of Muhammad because the best source of the sunnah of Muhammad is the Quran. And the best source of the seerah of Muhammad is not Ibn Ishaq or Ibn Sham or Aban or al maqrizi even though these are good books. But the best part of the seerah is the Quran. And if you read al maqrizi more than the Quran, you will think that Muhammad is all about fighting. And this is not the seerah of Muhammad because al maqrizi or Ibn Ishaq are writing mostly about battles and what happened with the captives and so on. And some of them are not true, by the way, some of these very harsh incidents are not true. And the Quran is not saying that. Uh, the, the Quran is different. It's talking about battles differently and dealing even with captives differently and so forth. And then you find a gap between what the Quran is saying and what is narrated about Muhammad Wasallam. even though what is narrated could be true, but is very partial. And this is a problem of partialism. And if we don't read the Quran for ourselves, the proportions of things in Islam are not going to be right in our hearts and our minds. What the Quran is focusing on is important in Islam. And what the Quran is focusing on less is less important in Islam. Even if you have 10 volumes of hadith about it, the hadith could be true, but it's less important. It is maybe something recommended or something that happened during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu but it's not one of the pillars of Islam. The pillars of Islam is in the Quran. And the major sins of Islam is in the Quran. Yes, the hadith is going to give you some sins. Um, Al-Kaba'ir, for example, look at a hadith Al-Kaba'ir. There are about a dozen of a hadith about Al-Kaba'ir, different companions uh, narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu said that this is Kabira, this is a major sin. 
But if you look at Kabair in the Quran, you will find them with all of these a hadith and some, because there are Kabair in the Quran that are not mentioned in the hadith. Um, for example, like, you know, Surah An-Nisa started with that, about Yatama, about the orphans, taking the inheritance of the orphans to your, to your wealth. That is like major in the Quran and talking about Yatim in general. But you find a couple of hadith only dealing with it. And you don't find as much details as in the Quran. It's not that the hadith is wrong or bad or any of that, but it's just partial. It is people who narrated in order to keep the legacy, if you wish, of the Prophet in a particular way. But if you don't read the Quran for yourself, you are not going to see Islam in its right proportions. The most important topic in the Quran is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioned thousands of times. And then Allah's creation is mentioned thousands of times. But you don't find almost any hadith about Allah's creation. Abu Darda and Abu Dhar عنهم, had a very interesting hadith. They said that the Prophet ﷺ died, but by the time he died, he would have given us knowledge about anything we see around, including a bird that flies. Uh, they said that he gave them ilm about everything that they see around them, including birds that fly. Where are these birds a hadith, and mountains a hadith, and trees a hadith? But you find them in the Quran. You find a lot about al kawn about the, the universe. And the mountains, for example, are very interesting. The mountains have a character, actually. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the mountains about the amana, and the mountains disagree to carry the amana. And then the mountains, when they heard that people worship Jesus, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is in Surah Maryam, the mountain almost fell down. Allah said in the Quran, Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah that some of the rocks of the mountains fall down because of the awe of Allah. That, that is a very different worldview from a worldview of the mountain as iron or copper or any of that. That, that is not the Islamic worldview. That is a very chemical worldview of the iron or the earth or the tectonics and these things. But the Quran is talking about mountains as a life. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعة متصدعة. Have we revealed this Quran to a mountain? You will find the impact on the mountain, and not just the mountains. The the, the ant is talking about Sulaiman, and that is not a myth. That is an ant, but she knows that this is Sulaiman and this is an army, and they are going from point A to point B, and they are going to destroy the homes. Until today with all of this technology and cameras and so on, we're shocked that we discovered that actually ants have a language. It's just the past few years. But the Quran is giving us a very complex, not just language. She knows he's Sulaiman, and she knows, and that is what the Quran is saying. Until two decades ago, people who are attackers of Islam, they say, how come you have ants speaking and donkeys and camels, and what is this? What is this deen that you have or animals? The animals are not even conscious. And yes, if you study neuroscience today, there is no consciousness for trees or animals, only for humans in a very limited way, in a very chemical way. But in Islam, the human is not defined chemically. The human is different. In Islam, water is not H2O. Water is different. Water has a conscious. Water, we created everything from water, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will find the talk about water very interesting and if you are into these sciences you should know that water has a very different perspective when you read the Quran versus when you uh, deal with it as seriously H2O and that's it and there is no meaning in it and it, it doesn't have and then when the Japanese guy what his name uh, froze some of the drops of water and then the crystals took different shapes based on the environment around them and when he froze Zamzam and he found that Zamzam takes a very particular shape that's different from every other water and so they considered this in the mainstream science pseudoscience. But that is, that's not pseudoscience. That's what Islam is telling us, that anything that Allah created is alive and conscious. And that's a very different worldview. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the Quran. And the Quran as described in the Quran is different from the Quran as you learn in an average place, because the Quran in the Quran is, is different. The Quran in the Quran, you're supposed to read it whole, and you're not supposed to partition it. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَى الْمُقْتَسِمِينَ الَّذِينَ جَعَلُوا الْقُرْآنَ عِضِينَ Those who partitioned the Qur'an, cut the Qur'an into organs. This is a bid'ah. And we're not supposed to partition the Qur'an. We're supposed to connect the Qur'an. That is a different reading from when we used to memorize the Qur'an. And our sheikh, you know, used to cut the ayah into different words and start from even the middle of the word, not even the middle of the ayah in order to test whether we memorize or not. That's a very partitioning way. I don't remember, Allah Yerhamu, or, or sheikhs, anyway, who taught us the Quran. I don't remember telling us, oh, oh, this ayah is linked to the ayah before, you know, and because this surah is talking about this, the surah after is going to be talking about this. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala said, here this way and here this way, even though they're similar, because here he's talking about the whole people, but here he's talking about one particular person. Never had that when we memorize the Quran because we partition it, we partialize it, we don't really connect it as the Quran is telling us uh, to do. Now, when you read the Quran for yourself, you will see that Islam is not the deen of Muhammad only. Islam is the deen of every prophet. Islam is the deen of Adam and Nuh and Musa and Isa and Ibrahim. Ibrahim was not a Jew or a Christian. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. And you will start to look at history in a very different way. Not my topic, but just to give you a pointer to it, that the history of Christianity is actually the history of Islam. But we read it upside down because we look at the heretics as the heroes and the heroes as the heretics. That is how we read the history of Christianity. That's in the Quran. The Quran is saying that Isa وسلم, fought and then the Hawariyin who came after him. And if you don't have the Michelangelo picture in your mind, the Hawariyin from the Hadith were 12,000. They were not just uh, 12 people that you see in the, on, on the, uh, in the Vatican. And if your worldview is shaped by Islam, you will know that the Hawariyin fought. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the followers of Jesus fighting their enemies until they conquered. Those are not 12 people, one of them went this and that. And no, no, this is not the Michael Anglo picture of the Hawariyin. This is the Quranic picture. And therefore, when you read the Quran, you will have a different outlook on history. The history of Islam, Isa, and all the way until Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when Muhammad وسلم, sent a message to Hiraq, Hercules, he told him, وَإِلَّمْ تُسْلِمْ فَإِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ إِثْمُ الْأَرِيسِيِّينَ If you don't uh, accept Islam, you carry the burden of the Aryans. Who are the Aryans? According to Christian history, the Aryans are the followers of Arius. And Arius is a heretic. And you see those, I guess Raphael put him under the feet of the priests. They step on him because he's a heretic. In Islam, Arius is Muslim. And Muhammad وسلم, told Hercules that you should follow the path of the Aryans, and they knew very well. And similarly, the king of Ethiopia at that time knew very well what Muhammad is talking about because they had the right history. But when you don't read the Quran, you don't have that part of the history of Islam. History of Islam for you is going to be the Umayyads and the Abbasides and the wars and the palaces and the poetry and so forth. And that is not the true history of Islam. The history of Islam after Muhammad of course should be studied, but is a history of a civilization. Before Muhammad this is still Islam. The followers of Musa were Muslims. You read the Quran, you will see that they are talking about themselves as Muslims. Uh, they are Muslim, the Quran is saying, and therefore the children of Israel were Muslims. Yes, they eventually worshipped other di deities and they killed some of their prophets and, and the Quran is telling us about that. And some of them continue to be Muslim until they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala following Jesus. And some of them continue to be Muslim until they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala following Muhammad Salman al-Farisi is an example. And therefore, when you read the Quran, you will have a different worldview. You will define your existence differently, your place in history. Uh, what you mean by Islam when you say that you're Muslim? You will find, define that differently. And you will define history differently, and therefore you will acquire a different identity. Because your identity is Muslim, you, that you live in a particular country, and when you identify yourself today, you identify yourself with a nation state, 
and then a religion and then a race. And all of these are true, but this is not the core identity. The core identity of believers is being a believer. Whether you are Canadian or Nigerian or Russia, it doesn't really matter. Yes, you respect the law and you live in a country that has a certain political system, but that's different from the identity. And I'm talking about the core of the Muslim identity being shaped by the Quran, because the Quran doesn't shape our identity anymore and we identify and therefore we enter into what the Quran calls jahiliya, the pre-Islamic, um, you know, all of these uh, ignorism, jahiliya is translated as ignorism. Anything with ya and ta, they call it in Arabic masdar sana'i or um, this, so jahiliya is jahilism really, so ignorism really. Now, another problem, and I don't want this to be uh, very long, but another, another issue is the question of how. And this would be my, my last point, even though I wanted to elaborate a bit on that. Inshallah, perhaps in some other uh, lecture or seminar. The question of how is very important. How are you going to read the Quran? Where to start and where to end? And what you should look for when you do that tadabbur, when you do that tadabbur. What is tadabbur? Uh, tadabbur is to look at something after it passed from the back. Uh, the Quran is saying a lot about tadabbur or, or dubur, uh, is, is when something passes and then you see it from the back, which means tadabbur is to read the ayah and then you reflect upon it and you look at the impact at the objective, at the purpose of the ayah. Why? Why is this ayah in the Quran? Why is Allah telling us about Adam, that story, and about Yusuf, that story, and about Muhammad, sallallahu and why is the mountain described this way? And why is he telling us to give charity over and over and over? And why is he telling us about the hereafter this way? so that we perhaps do something in the dunya differently, so that in the year after we have a dip, and so forth. So tadabbur is primarily, in my view, to ask about, about why, and to reflect about the wisdoms of what you are reading. And that requires a shift in the logic that we approach the Quran with, because so far what is dominant in not just the Muslim but the human logic is the logic of, if you wish, causality, rather than the logic of, I call it the philosophy teleology. But in Islam, would be a sabab wal ghayr. A sabab is a cause. We always think in terms of the past and how the past impacted our reality, and therefore we react based on events that happened in the past and it's impacting us, so we react. Versus thinking about the future, the Quran wants us to acquire something called taqwa. Okay, so taqwa is now a future goal. How can I acquire taqwa? What is taqwa? Taqwa is one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I'm going to do that. Therefore, it's a very different logic. It's a logic that is future looking or future oriented rather than a logic that is past oriented. And that shift is necessary for the reading of the Quran. Otherwise, we are going to read it as a book from the past which is something that is the reading of secular academia these days, um, the, the Orientalist school in its new form, is looking at Islam as a social phenomenon, rather than Islam as a deen, rather than Islam as a way of life. And therefore, you study Islam as the history of Islam. You go study Islamic law, and you study the Shafi'i and Ahnaf al Hanabla. You don't study how to give fatwa today. This is, you don't study this in U of T here because it is transformed into a history. And the history is true, and we all had to study history in order to become scholars. But the history is not Islam. The history is the history of Islam, and Islam is how the Quran applies for today. The question of why is going to make that shift from being past-oriented to being future-oriented. And from being non-critical, to being critical. Because once you ask why, you're asking questions of justice and questions of wisdom and questions of mercy. You're asking why, why is this a rule in Islam? Uh, why does Islam differentiate between men and women in the inheritance, for example? You're asking a question of justice. And that question is going to tie you to the social system in Islam and how it works. 
it's not working yet. That's a different story. We can talk about fatwa here and therefore see what are we going to do with the social system that was originally put in a particular way. Now it's not working. But you will not understand what Islam is about if you don't ask those why questions. And those why questions are critical questions. And we often don't allow our uh, kids to ask critical questions. But they're Canadian. They grow up here. Uh, they learn to be critical. They ask why. And wh what is this? Uh, isn't equality a principle in Islam? Uh, uh, right? But the right answer is no. Equality is not a principle in Islam. But that's now a different lecture. But that lecture is going, is go that, that answer is going to take them to understanding Islam, really. Islam doesn't equate everybody because this equality is a myth. There is nobody who is equal to, to anybody. Yes, there is equality and there is patriarchy and matriarchy. That this, like this is Orientalism. I'm talking about Islam. Does it mean that there is no justice? No, of course not. Islam is about justice. Islam is here to establish justice. But justice doesn't mean equality. It doesn't mean that everything allowed for a man is allowed for a woman. Not everything is allowed for a woman is allowed for a man. And not every trait that a man has is the same trait that a woman has. Oh, but you're talking roles, and that we learned in university that roles are not, um, are not right. To, because, yeah, that is postmodernism. Uh, postmodernism rejects the, con the concept of roles because they don't want people to have roles. They want people to have no identity for the sake of the markets and so forth. That's a long story, but that's a different lecture. But basically, it will allow our young generation to think critically, but we have to be brave enough to answer critically as well. Um, how come, uh, I get this question all the time, and last time I was here, it's five years ago, and I gave that lecture, I, I mentioned that sentence, and it caused me so much headache about the, uh, the, the age of Aisha radiallahu anha. Um, and when she married the Prophet and I mentioned that she was 17 or 18, she wasn't 6 or 9 and there are different opinions but of course I totally reject the opinion of 6 or 9 and so forth and of course we have to have the bravery to talk about it. yes it's a hadith in Bukhari but there, every scholar of Islam who is a serious scholar knows that there are some hadith in Bukhari that are not true and some narrators of Bukhari changed like Hisham ibn Urwa particularly. He changed when he became older and he had dementia or dementia, and that dementia affected some of his narrations. Fine, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just a matter of authenticating a hadith. But you find a whole storm of rejecting a hadith in Bukhari out of ignorance. Out of, read Ibn Hajar, who is the first commentary on Bukhari. You will find Ibn Hajar disagreed with about 80 hadiths of Bukhari. And, and, and read, read Bukhari on Muslim. You will find that Muslim, Bukhari disagreed with Muslim, Sahih Muslim. Disagreed on and said, no, no, this is not Abu Huraira, this is Ka'b, the, the rabbi. This is not this and this is that. It's a scholarship. But people, because of lack of critical knowledge, not just knowledge, critical knowledge, reading the Quran is going to open critical knowledge. And I think we need critical knowledge for the next generation so that Islam's legacy continues. I think that, um, she's telling my brothers before the lecture, that I think that Islam's legacy is going to continue, but only with a critical view of our inheritance and only a critical view of how far or close we are from the original form of Islam, which is the Quran. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. Jazakumullah khair. I hope uh, this was not um, uh, too much to uh, put in, in one lecture, but I, I thought that I would, inshallah, open uh, issues so that we can have a discussion. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Shukran, uh, Ya Sheikh. Uh, so, as, as you can see, we had a, a very good, a deep uh, analysis of approaching the Quran and also a bit of a preview of what's to come. So if this is any indication, you can imagine what tomorrow would be like. Uh, so on that note, I would encourage you, if you haven't registered and you're interested in coming, we will also accept walk-ins. Uh, but if, if, uh, if uh, you can, we encourage you to register. The registration has been reopened, inshallah. So we have a few minutes uh, before Salat al -Isha. I would encourage you to, uh, we don't have this opportunity all the time. and. Um, uh, the Sheikh is, is also very busy and in demand, so we have this unique opportunity to interact with him. 
So I'd encourage you if you have any questions, if you have any uh, clarification that's required, if anything he said you want to challenge him, I'm sure he would be uh, open to that as well. So any, any questions, any comments? Yes, yes, go ahead, sister. The question is, you asked us to reflect upon the Qur'an for ourselves. To what limit? To what limit should we stop when we uh, reflect? Uh, you should stop when you feel that you are not qualified to talk about something. But if you have the knowledge to reflect, reflect upon your book. Allah is talking to you. You have to reflect. And our sister gave an example which is a good example. She said, I read the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you look at the mountains, you think that they are stable, but they are passing. And she said, she made a simile or a metaphor between this and sometimes when she feels very sad. And sadness is like a mountain. And she said, well, sadness will pass as the mountains pass in the Quran. Is this right or wrong? This is right and this is, this is a good reflection on the Quran. Is this the tafsir of the Quran? No, and neither Ibn Kathir's comments or Tabari or myself, we will all reflect upon the Quran. But because Ibn Kathir is a historian, his comments were shaped by his history. And because I deal with matter of sciences and, and methodology and so on, this will be shaping sciences because I deal with that. And because the Tabari was more into the fiqh and so on, so you find a lot of fiqh there. And because Ibn Ashur dealt with Maqasid al-Shari'ah, everything is Maqasid al-Shari'ah. Because every reflector upon the Qur'an will have their own view. And your view is not wrong. When it becomes wrong is when the language cannot hold it. Uh, the, the language, and, and you are claiming that no, Allah is not talking about mountains, He's talking about sadness. That is wrong. But when you say, well, yeah, my sadness is like that mountain that will pass. That, that is khatara, that is a reflection. But I'm telling you that every scholar, even who wrote commentaries on the Quran, they are reflecting too. But they have a different area, different level, different view, different understanding. Some of the scholars looked at the qiraat, the readings. Some of them looked at the grammar. Some of them, uh, instead of this perhaps psychological reflection, some of them looked at the same um, ayah from a, I don't know, ge geo geophysics reflection. And they said, oh, the mountains and the passing. And yes, if you look at them from uh, outside the planet, you will see as if they are passing. It's exactly like a mountain. I saw a picture passed by me, something of that. I said, that's very interesting because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks something, he doesn't mean one thing, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, except in the tawheed and shirk. Allah is one and there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these kinds of verses in the Quran, they don't have just one wajh, we call it al-wujuh al qurani not just one face, not just one interpretation, but many interpretations, because that's the nature of the Quran. The Quran could carry many interpretations. You could read it and you find something that helps you because you are looking for it. And that's part of the purpose of it. Yeah, please. Alaikum <laughs> salam. Yeah. Yeah, well, alhamdulillah, my, my brother is asking about that individual tafsir doesn't, is not equal to Allah's intent. But is there a way of a contemporary tafsir? You, that's your question? Collective. Well, some groups of scholars produce books. Usually scholarship in Islam is more an individual thing. Uh, fatwa is more of a collective effort because people debate. But when you reflect upon the Quran to, uh, to write a tafsir or to have a tafsir, of course you, you learn from everybody around you and your staff and your students. 
But collective tafsir, I haven't seen that. I have seen one that came out of Sharqa University that's called Tafsir al-Mawdu'i, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the thematic tafsir, thematic tafsir uh, published by Sharqa University. And it was done by about 20 scholars. But my understanding is that it was divided over the scholars, not that they sat together. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from his mercy, he made the book open. And there is always new reflections about the book because the book never ends. And the Sahaba who understood very well that feature of the Quran, they said that Islam is not closed. They never closed Islam. They never, Imam Ali عنه, when he was asked, وكرم الله وجه, about like, is what you have from the Prophet وسلم, is the final knowledge, is this the closed knowledge? He said, no, إلا فهمًا أُتِيهِ رَجُلٌ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ Maybe, maybe a man will come after us who will understand more than us. And that's Imam Ali speaking, who is the most knowledgeable of the Quran with only a few, right? Uh, therefore, you are talking about as much knowledge as you get from the Quran, somebody is going to come in the, in, in the future and is going to have new, because, new opinions because the Quran never ends. It really never ends. And the nature of the language and the structure of that book is, I could say, with like, like forgive me for this heavy statement, is highly untapped so far, highly untapped. Uh, I, read, I read a number of books of tafsir, and of course there are many, many in incredible efforts, but this book is highly untapped, and it's not really shaping the Islamic culture as it should. My brother, okay, sure. On the book on what? Yep. Uh, on my website, or I'll give you my contacts. Yeah, yeah, sure. In terms of books, inshallah, we'll, we'll talk after the lecture. I'm more than happy to give you a gift of whatever books you, you want. Um, in terms of art, yes, Islam has a different approach to art. And when you read the Quran with artistic eyes, you will see things that are different from uh, the other guys who read the Quran with not those artistic eyes. Um, from what I read, I'm not an artist, but I read what some of the artists and literists and so forth wrote about the Quran. Uh, for example, the colors in the Quran and how they are linked to emotions, how they are classified to start with is a matter of like, you find a few books out there on the classification of colors in the Quran, a thesis and stuff, not popular stuff, because that's, that's not something that uh, captures the, the, perhaps the popular uh, attention. But you will find a few theses on colors in the Quran and how colors are used to serve the meanings of the ayat. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about that yellow cow of the children of Israel, or when he talks about the green in Jannah, or when he talks about the blue in the hereafter of the skin of the people, or um, when, when subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions the gold and silver as a color, so for example, so you will read the Quran looking for, if you are somebody who's into colors and so on and expression, you will look at that and you will start to draw some relations between the Quranic colors and, and the colors. If you are into literature, for example, uh, read uh, Sayyid Qutbs, for example, at tasweer al I think it's in English, uh, the artistic expression in the Quran. And he was originally, of course, he, he became a mufassir, he wrote a tafsir, that is uh, recognized by most of the, the scholars of Islam. But I'm saying that um, when he was a literalist, a, a lit, literal, literist, literist, literature uh, expert, look at uh, his chapters on the, um, the drama in the Quran, like he speaks in that language how the scene started, and especially focused on Surah Yusuf, and he had some brilliant uh, reading of the Quran from a literature perspective. 
uh, and how the story is built and how the scenes are changing and how the personalities are built over time until the end of the surah, the personalities start. That kind of language that you would be familiar with if you are into literature. You will find that uh, some scholars of Islam, I'm mentioning Sayyid Qutb for an example, wrote about that uh, and his brother, Muhammad Qutb, Allah, both of them, uh, his brother Muhammad Qutb wrote about as well um, the Quran and the Taswir, the, the, the pictures in the Quran and, and so forth. Uh, Islam has a different outlook on arts, a different approach, because it doesn't personify. We don't, it, it doesn't mean that personification is haram. It, it, no, that's not what I'm saying. And no, it isn't haram by default. It could be haram if you personify something haram. But my point is that we are not a personification art uh, culture. Like there is a mosque, you don't see pictures of the Sahaba. Or, like we don't do that. We uh, read Ismail Farooqi's Atlas of Islam. He has a book, like a thick book, on the artistic history of Islam. And he is explaining the philosophy of the shapes, the philosophy of the domes and the arabesque and the using of the leaves and so forth. He wrote it with his wife, Lamia al Farooqi. Uh, they were killed over their activism in the United States. But basically, they, they, they wrote that book, and it's a fantastic book on Islamic arts. And they link at Tawheed. They say that at the heart of arts in Islam is the oneness of Allah. And from that theory of the oneness of Allah, and they come from a phenomenological phenomenology perspective, and from the phenomenologist approach, they uh, came up with the Tawheed theory of arts. It's brilliant. I'm, contact inshallah if you're interested. Uh, thank you very much. Now the discussion is getting interesting, but we have to, and we have to, inshallah, we have to, uh, yeah, maybe afterwards, after you can uh, interact with the Sheikh. Uh, but my apologies, but we have to um, break for Salat al Isha. I want to once again uh, express our sincere thanks uh, to our dear uh, Sheikh. Uh, he is part of the IIT family, uh, has been uh, part of uh, the intellectual circle that we rely on for ongoing advice and support, and he has always been an advocate and a support and a friend and an ally of the Islamic Institute of Toronto, and we feel very, very privileged to have him with us this weekend. As I mentioned, today and uh, the Juma today that I spoke about very briefly in my introduction is an indication of the versatility that he comes with and the intellectual capacity that he comes with. One of the things that I found always interesting listening to him is that I always learn something new um, or he reinforced an idea. And one idea that I think he reinforced today is that as professionals, if we approach the Quran with our professional background and professional eyes, uh, we can see things that normally without that Islamic uh, background, uh, we may not see. And as someone who spent a lot of time in, in public policy and, and around elected officials and in leadership role, I can see the importance of reflecting on the Quran and the Quranic verses and on, of course, the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So once again, I want to thank you for coming out. I encourage you to come tomorrow, inshallah. And once again, thanks, our Sheikh. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.